continue from yesterday, uh, we're going to talk about move the security second part. And here is today's syllabus. Uh, first part, we're going to compare move with solidity. And second, we're going to look at uh, some audit reports and some common vulnerabilities in move. And third, uh, we're going to have a little game, CTF. It's that way. So uh, what's the difference between move and solidity? Uh, in terms of what makes move safe, there are, uh, overall there are three types of safety. Type safety, resource safety, and reference safety. And that's enabled by move's type system. In type safety, there's no confusion on aliasing and mutability. So move is a strongly typed system. And you cannot convert one type to another under any circumstance. And for, in terms of resource security, it says resource can only have two capabilities, key and store. Uh, in move, objects are a very important concept, and we limit what objects can do in resource security. Uh, reference security, if you ever use other program, programming language such as C++, you know that a dangling pointer is a big issue. Uh, for example, if you have a dangling pointer, you can, you can modify uh, arbitrary objects a move, however, follows Rust ownership rule. And uh, any local variable inside a function can have one and only one owner at a, at a given time. For a global variable, there's one and only one owner of any type in the entire blockchain. The second part is move versus solidity. So what's, what are the differences? First is asset safety. Assets in MOVE cannot be copied, lost, and reused. This ensures the security of assets. Uh, in Solidity, Solidity defines assets in the form of values, which can be copied and reused, which makes assets have certain risks, such as reentrancy attacks uh, when assets are being reused, and uh, infinite incremental issuing of assets. And even before, for example, uh, the overflow, integer overflow and underflow, which can actually arbitrarily modify the assets amount. And there's permission safety. In Solidity, the default function visibility is public, which means everyone can call the function. In move, however, it is private, and you have to enable it. Um, objects have different capabilities. The ability to use job, copy, and store uh, can limit the object's uh, can limit the object's permission scope. So here's the part about uh, storage safety. Uh, in Solidity, the balance of each address is stored in a state variable of type mapping. That is, uh, the key is address and the value is u in two hundred fifty six. This is stored in a global storage at a specific contract. So for example, uh, here's a contract address. And here it sits in smart contract. And there's a mapping called balances, which will map address to balance. In move, global storage is indexed by addresses. Each address stores move modules and move resources. Any, and resource storage is a type to value mapping. So, uh, uh, Compare, compare from Solidity, every single address will store their own assets. That is, uh, move resources. And the resource storage is type to value mapping. That means there's a type, general type. For example, there's a custom type coin. And value is how much coin that you hold. Uh, static safety. In uh, in Solidity, reentrancy is a big issue, and the root cause of reentrancy is the uh, is a dynamic part of Solidity calling stack. Uh, in Move, however, it is static. It means it's deterministic when you initiate a transaction. For example, here you can see that you initiate a transaction. You know exactly how much coin you are sending and how much coin you are receiving. And wallets can make it uh, easier for users to understand what transaction they are going to conduct by incorporating this function inside the wallet user interface. Therefore, users will not, 
um, a wish on their luck when they sign transactions anymore. Move also has this um, verification safety. It has this tool called Move Prover that you can write specifications for your program. And you can prove using the, uh, the specifications that you just wrote to, to uh, verify that your program actually meets all those requirements. So for example, uh, on the top, this is how you install this Move Prover. And uh, to run it, you just say Move Proof dash T and test name. Uh, so let's see what we're trying to prove here. This is uh, uh, the, the proof language, which is uh, different from Move itself. Here's uh, just a, a, part, a code snippet of Move contract. And it says invariant for all A address where exists account, balance is smaller or equal to max balance. So this is a, a global invariant that will make sure every single account uh, every single account will have a balance that is uh, lower than the max balance. Uh, integer overflow and underflow. In Solidity version later than 0 0.8.0, .0, overflow and underflow is stopped at, compi uh, at the uh, compiler level. Uh, in move, it's the same thing. Overflow and underflow is uh, stopped at the move VM level. So if you write code like this, this will not go through and throw an error. It says uh, arithmetic error. So it will know that you, ha you have an overflow there. Uh, however, same as Solidity version, even later than 0 0.8.0, bitwise operation is not protected. Bitwise operation is not common. And um, when you have an overflow or underflow, this will, go, uh, this will go unchecked. So just be careful when you use bitwise operations. Uh, let's see some uh, audit and common vulnerabilities. So what, what is code audit? We generalize a um, code audit uh, into two parts. That is static analysis and dynamic analysis. Static analysis means that we are just reading the code or we are searching the code. Uh, the, the most basic part is code review. We just read through the code and try to find out what the code does. And then we can use code query. This is um, especially important in traditional language like C++ and Java that we have the code query engine that we can search certain vulnerable patterns and to see that um, if any vulnerable code exists in our project because the code base might be huge. And, um, but in Move currently there's, or in Rust for example, currently there's um, no available tools for code query. Uh, dynamic analysis means that we're actually running the code. The first part it will be debugging. Any developer uh, in the testing phase, when they're trying to figure out what went wrong, they will use debugging. Uh, fuzzy means uh, generate random inputs and feed, feed to, the, for example, the function and try to see if the result is unexpected. Formal verification falls into both categories. They're doing both a static and dynamic analysis. Here's, here are the steps to audit a move smart contract. First, when we come in touch with a project, we research the architecture, purpose, and the use of the platform. And then we'll perform manual review of the smart contract to identify any logic issues. And then we'll write tests to uh, test if the function behave as expected. But this will only tell you that function um, can behave expected, not function will behave expected all the time. So here are the, um, are the uh, macros for tests. And here that means uh, the following version will be test. And here this one means um, 
this, this one, when you define variables, test only, that means the variable will only be used during tests. And here, there's an expected failure. That means the test supposed to uh, abort, supposed to fail. And the command, for example, in Aptos is Aptos move test. So to use move prover, we need to write move specification language, MSL. This enables move prover to perform formal verification on our important variables. And then after we can formally uh, verify some important properties, we can continue to deploy the smart contract on the dev net, like we did yesterday, to perform some on-chain testing of core functions. We can either use a, a CLI or a, a GUI for that. So here is a, a vulnerability example, and it's from Aptos Liquid Swap. It's the biggest um, swap project like Uniswap in Ethereum. And um, yeah, so let's, let's look at this code and see um, if you can find out what is missing. And hint is Oracle. Just uh, maybe give it three minutes. Uh, the code itself is not vulnerable, but when you incorporate with other projects, some problems might arise. Uh, uh, a backstory, uh, last year, October, Chain Security um, revealed a vulnerability in Curve, and afterwards, a lot of uh, projects that forked Curve's code base got exploited. Uh, it was because uh, the read-only reentrancy, that means, um, for example, if you are, uh, uh, for example, those, those pool usually support a flash loan function. You can, you can flash loan a huge amount of token out of the pool in one transaction and return it. Uh, you just need to return at the end of the transaction. But during the transaction, the pool's token balance change drastically. Some of, the, some of the ratio might be out of balance. Because DeFi protocol is so inter interconnected, a lot of other DeFi protocols use uh, Uniswap or those um, other, other liquidity pools for their price, price, um, price reference. And if a malicious actor or um, trying to get some profit, they can get flash loan from this pool and then, uh, and then invoke other contracts function if at the same time the contract calls in to this pool contract and trying to get the price prediction, they will get it wrong because the pool balance has been changed drastically and that the attackers can get profits that way by price manipulation. Uh, the way to fix it is to have a variable that makes pool to be in a lock status, to, to, to make the pool in a lock state when flash loan is performed. So here's a, a reference of uh, the backstory. This happened in the uh, Ethereum ecosystem, but the same type of vulnerability carries on to the move ecosystem because, um, because it's a business logic issue, not the code issue. I encourage you to go and check out this exact uh, exploit. So uh, here is another example of, uh, of vulnerabilities found in real world. And this is a SUI uh, AMM swap that is a, a Uniswap-like swapping SUI. And we're looking at this swap out function. You can take a look and see if you can spot the bug here. Another three minutes. Uh, this one might be a little bit hard because uh, it, it, it uh, involves some uh, maybe auditing experience. And um, do you have any answers? If not, I'm just going to explain it. Uh, so basically, there's a K value in, in the Uniswap-like uh, router. So for, for the coin balance before, um, so for example, the 
state before the swap is, uh, is x1, and the state after the swap is x2 for the token 1. And for token 2, the uh, state before swap is x2, and uh, sorry, it's y1, and uh, after swap is y2. And those product would be called k value. And we need to make sure that k value is greater, is greater than the, uh, the previous k value, because that also includes the transaction fee. Mm. If we don't verify that uh, the k value is always bigger, then attackers might find some arithmetic error to drain funds from the, your pool. And that's a pretty dangerous um, proposition. So every single, every single uh, Uniswap-like contract needs to have this k value verification after swap. If, if, um, if the verification is not in place, the attacker can potentially exchange small number of tokens for almost all tokens inside the pool if the balance is of his ideal because that's completely determined by some math equations. Here we added a simple check here, a third statement that ensures that coin X reserve, this is the previous one. And then this is the, the, the new balance after the swap. So we make, we, make, we make sure that the previous K value is smaller than the new K value. And now uh, I'm going to introduce capture the flag. Uh, so here's a, a tweet by one of, one of the uh, security researcher in Twitter. And currently in the blockchain space, most security companies, um, they're rooted in CTF teams. So basically, we came from traditional security background and migrate to Web3. Uh, for example, companies like Zelic, Autosec, New Dime, and Theory, those are very famous companies uh, specialized in, in EVM, Rust, and Move, and they perform audits for lots of uh, important projects. And most of them were just uh, college uh, CTF teams several years back. And um, CTF is a really good way to hone your skills and think, think out of box. And uh, I believe that every single auditor, every, everyone who's interested in security should participate in CTF and before, before they uh, dive in and learn all, all types of information. Yeah, because this, this ecosystem can get really complex and the information is updating constantly. And we need to keep a sharp mind by constantly um, honing our skills. Uh, there are lots of CTFs in traditional um, web security. I can't list them all, but in the blockchain ecosystem, there are also CTFs that are quite famous, and um, I encourage you to check them out and maybe participate, uh, participate in, in, in one of them, maybe. Uh, those CTFs are completely free, and you can just uh, register with your email, and when, when the, uh, the deadline comes, you can just join. So um, here's the Paradigm CTF. They update their CTF question every year based on the current trend. So for example, um, last year's Paradigm CTF, they added smart contracts in Rust, which represents Solana contracts. They added contracts in Cairo, uh, which is a, a StockNet. And they also had the traditional EVM solidity questions. Uh, for today, I'm introducing Move, so I'm um, also putting a Move CTF here that is hosted by MoveBit. Uh, last year, they had a CTF on Sui and a CTF on Aptos. So we are gonna look at the past year question in Sui that is uh, called Hero Game. How many, how, how many of you have looked at the, this code before? No? 
Uh, and this might be a little bit complex, so I'm just going to give you maybe five minutes to look at the code first. I'm going to explain what this game is and uh, how to solve it later. I'm going to introduce like, what this game is and um, how to win this game. Uh, this game name is Adventure, and it basically takes in a story of a hero and um, killing boars and getting getting up, um, getting leveled up, and then um, win win battles and to get treasure box. And once you pass in treasure box, there you can get a flag, which is the uh, uh, the winning condition. So let's see how we can win this game. In order to uh, have a flag emitted, we have to invoke this public entry function get flag. Public entry means that you can invoke it uh, using a key by anybody. That's like the entry point of uh, a module. And once you pass in your treasure box, the treasure box will get, will get deleted. And here, you have a one out of 100 chance to get this flag. The chances are pretty slim. It looks not good. Let's see how we can get the treasure box. In order to get the treasure box, we have to go into adventure. And first, the hero's uh, HP point is pretty low. Uh, to, in order to level up, we need to gain experience by slaying boar. And after we get this, uh, after we slay boar, we have chances of getting a sword or armor and they can increase our uh, um, offense and defense. Um, after our, our HP point is um, bigger than 200, we can get a level up, and we are able to uh, challenge the Slave Ball King. If we can defeat the Slave Ball King in this Slave Ball King function, then there's a one out of 100 chance that we can get the treasure box. So one out of 100 chance to get a treasure box, and one out of 100 time that there's actually treasure inside the treasure box. The game seemed pretty difficult to solve. And interestingly, during this uh, real, real competition, one of my colleagues used a brute force script to solve this challenge. And I think he was really lucky because he actually got it solved. It's one out of 100 times one out of 100 chances. So. Lucky guy. But the intended solution is definitely not like that, because not everyone is that lucky. This involves the concept of uh, predicting random number in blockchain. If you generate a random number in blockchain, there's a chance that attackers can replicate this number. It happened a lot in the EOS system, for example, and uh, Ethereum also as well. And uh, when you can predict the random number, a lot of things can be messed up. For example, if you have a casino game that, that will uh, determine that you won this game or not based on some random number, if an attacker can predict the random number, then he will always win, like diamond hand. So a lot of people uh, exploited um, pre randomness vulnerability in EOS ecosystem and basically ruined the, uh, the, the gambling game sphere. Uh, getting a random number is always a, a, a tough topic in blockchain. Some off-chain element is uh, usually needed. For example, some oracles such as um, Chainlink that will um, give you a reliable random number. But if you generate random number uh, with some blockchain elements, for example, in Ethereum, if you, generate, um, if you generate random number using the current timestamp, the current time uh, block stamp, uh, uh, sorry, block number, block hash, and timestamp, the attackers can generate the same number in the same transaction as long as it is, um, it is included in the same transaction. So uh, for example, if, uh, if a game in Ethereum have a winning number that is the hash of the current block hash plus the current timestamp, obviously it's a future event, so nobody will know what the, uh, what the hash or timestamp of that block is. But the attacker can create a small contract that will hash the current block's hash and the current block's timestamp. And if the attacker got the number, he can continue the transaction. If the number is not correct, then he can maybe uh, revert the transaction so he doesn't lose anything. 
but if he, um, he got a number, then he can get all the rewards. So here, it's the same concept. We need to generate a random number in order to uh, always get the treasure box when we beat the ball king and always have treasure in our treasure box. Hey, I have a question. Yeah. So in this example, is it possible to force the variable tx context to zero, so thereby defining that random number so we always get the treasure box? Is that one approach to solving this? Uh, it's not. TX Tx contact is not a variable that we control. It's the current transaction context. Okay. So it, it cannot force that number to no. find number. No. But in a regular program, yes, you can. Okay. Tx context is just a special variable in this uh, SUI blockchain that represents the current, the current context of transaction. For example, the signer, the signer address can be derived from Tx context. So let's see how they generate their random number. Uh, here is how they generate the seed. So here we can see BCS is just a serialized function in SUI. Um, Two variables are being used. One is CTX bytes, that is the uh, serialized bytes of the uh, transaction, current transaction context. And the UID is a new, newly created object. Uh, it seems like it's quite easy to replicate, right? But it's not that simple because um, in SUI, when you create a new object, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a value that gets incremented and uh, just to demonstrate that. So to understand this mechanism, we need to dive into the SUI's code base. And here is the uh, uh, SUI's code in uh, tr transaction context. As we can see in a function new object, when a new object is created, the current transaction context property ID created is incremented by one. And let's see what is the, uh, the structure of, yeah, the structure transaction context, it has a, it has a um, element IDs created, that is a, a U44, U, U64 value. And in move, you cannot, you cannot modify uh, this struct unless you are inside this module, which we obviously are not in this module. So we have to basically unserialize the transaction and add our, add, and increment this value and then reserialize it, which basically involves us to dive into the source code on how to unserialize hash it and what offsets of bytes that we need. The, the object of our mission is to get the number of objects created for the current transaction. We can get the value of the next UID and thus know the return value of the next seed. So this is our, um, I guess, it's the game plan. So, yeah. So we first, we will slay board enough times to get ourselves leveled up, then we will slay the ball king. That's the basic game plan. But in terms of um, predicting the randomness, CT CTX bytes is relatively easy, but UID bytes is, uh, we need some manipulation. And we need, when, after we get these two values, we can generate the, the random number and we can always win. Here, I, incre I implemented my own uh, random library that, that differs slightly from the original random library because we basically cannot modify the ch current transaction context and we need to get the values, de deserialize it, add all value and serialize again. 
this basically is the solution to, um, to predict this random number. It's relatively complex because we basically did some vector slice to get the correct offset of the, offset of the transaction hash. And those things can be, uh, can be obtained from reading the source code. For example, uh, the hash function they use is the SHA-3-256. So afterwards, we can uh, create our solving script. We will import the target contract to get the functions there. And then uh, we have this uh, uh, function that we can, for example, uh, we can first kill, kill, kill King to get this box. After we got the box, we can, uh, we can call the function win flag and get this flag. And I use some test functions to test if my random value is, is uh, indeed the predicted uh, random value of the function. So those are the uh, complex steps that people need to take to solve challenges, CTF challenges. It's, it's relatively complex, and uh, I know it's difficult to um, follow uh, just, just in this short period of time. But if you have any questions, just feel free to reach, uh, to reach me later. And uh, let's see how we solve the challenge on chain. Uh, I'm, going to in, uh, I'm going to first use SUI to deploy the challenge. And then I'm going to deploy the, uh, the solvers module and then call the solvers module to actually solve this game on chain. And in the end, you can see a flag event is emitted on chain, indicating that the game is solved. Yeah, I spent one and a half this morning to just to upgrade uh, my SUI binary. So uh, it's, it's, it takes a long time to, uh, to, to, to install those things. And maybe it's better to do this in a lab setting in the future so everyone can you know, do this at the same time. But uh, first, let's, let's deploy this contract deploy the game contract. So I have the SUI binary installed and that's the latest version, uh, 0 0.21.1. And I have uh, uh, created two addresses. I'll use the first address to deploy the game and the second address to act like a, a challenger to actually solve this challenge. I will deploy the CTF and game module to this address. So we move, build. We can see that this module is successfully built. So SUI is sim very similar to Aptos. So yesterday we did the Aptos move build as well. And then we will uh, we will publish our module. Must have. So as we can see, the module has been successfully published. Let's go to a blockchain explorer to see what our module looks like.
So here, we can see it's different from Aptos because we don't have module on our, on our own address. We actually publish module on the different address. So as we can see in this transaction, those uh, modules were being published. Adventure is being published. Hero is being published. Inventory is also being published. And the code looks a bit different. It's not the original move code anymore, but the compiled version. So our compiled module will be under those addresses. This one is the uh, adventure, hero, inventory, and random. And this one is, uh, is a hero. Hero is, is, is a separate object because it has different properties. So we can see that the defense, the experience, the HP level, st stamina, and strength. And the default armor and sword is no. So as a challenger, we're trying to um, solve this challenge. So I will switch my account to the, the other address. And in our game solve, that is the solving model, we, actu module, we actually imported the, um, the original CTF module, as we can see locally. So same, we will compile this contract first. It takes a while because this package is big. We imported the, another, the original game contract and our soft module. So in the meantime, just gonna introduce this, uh, my colleague solution that uses this um, brute force script. <laughs> so we can see that he actually called it a, a thousand times and just got lucky. Let's try to publish again. Okay. Um, 
Maybe my account doesn't have enough gas. So in, uh, to get the uh, test test suite, we can go to the uh, official Discord channel, Discord community. But be careful, because uh, I we talked yesterday about uh, the Discord fishing bot, and we can use their their DevNet fa faucet to get some test suite. Uh, seems like I'm out of time limit. So I just got some test test suite this morning, and maybe they didn't allow me to do it again. Yeah. Uh, sorry. So uh, seems like my another account doesn't have enough gas to deploy <laughs> this solver module. Maybe switch back. Yeah, uh, so my account is running out of gas. Maybe I will, um, I will, I will fi fix my gas problem in a, in a break time, and I will rede redeploy my solving module. OK, sorry. Yeah, that's, that's one thing you always uh, pray when you're doing a demo. Things don't go wrong. <laughs> OK, anyway. Uh, yeah, we, so we have our game modules uh, deployed here, but um, that's Let's carry on the solving um, part to the next lecture. And now 